Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. No matter how you look at it, animal agriculture helps Nebraska's economy. The livestock industry provides increased tax revenues for schools and community services. Livestock enterprises also create jobs while contributing to existing businesses such as local banks and grocery stores. A thriving livestock industry helps maintain our current way of life, but also provides opportunities for the next generation of farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff helps to raise awareness of the importance of animal agriculture to Nebraska. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Mike Briggs analyzes how the latest supply and demand estimates might affect cattle feeding margins. We show you our interview on soybean cyst nematode research with Greg Tilka at the World Soybean Research Conference in South Africa. Rick Rasby talks about feeding forages and residues to cattle. And Aaron Nigren demonstrates how growers can use ET gauges to monitor their crop water use. The USDA released its latest World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates Wednesday. The department is estimating no change to U.S. soybean supply and use from its last report, meaning the projected yield of 44.5 bushels per acre stays. The USDA is forecasting an increase in wheat production, increasing U.S. output by 23 million bushels. Nebraska's yield forecast moves up from 33 bushels per acre to 35 bushels per acre. The state is expected to produce its lowest wheat crop since 1944. And with 95% of this year's corn planted, the agency is lowering its forecast for production by 135 million bushels for a total of just more than 14 billion U.S. bushels. Yield is pushed down slightly to 156.5 bushels per acre. We started this week's market analysis with Mike Briggs by asking for his reaction to the corn estimates. I'm fine with it. Actually, I'd rather have that than something ridiculously unrealistic like when we had a 162 average. That's ridiculous. I think this is more, more like what we're going to have. And I think we're fine as long as we don't end up with under a billion bushel carryout. As long as we've got over, over a billion bushel carryout, I think the government's going to be really close and they're $4.80 cash corn. And those of us that feed livestock can make a living then. Did you uh, try to play around this one at all? No, my all week I heard from my broker, well, this isn't gonna be a big deal at all. You don't even worry about it. So I didn't worry about it. No, I really haven't done anything. And it's really hard to know what to do right now. It's a good question because with what's going on in the market itself, where you've got a lot of fund money leaving the market going into equities, the, the market's falling away, which I don't really totally understand in the nearby because the nearby is gonna be really tight and you're having to make basis do all the work. So now corn in this area is like 75 to 80 over. And to me, that's really out of kilter. I don't see why corn need to, ever, ever needs to get more than 30 cents either side of the board. And it's all a junction of money flow from the funds, and that really bothers me. You still, are you still kind of going off of a weather rally at this point? Or not at all for you? My biggest concern is actual physical supply of corn until the combines hit the field. And because we got late planted, now you've moved that back another 30 days. I don't think there'll be any early September, late August corn. It's gonna be late September, early October corn. So you've got a pretty big span of time. You've got 90 days here where you still get a deal with $7.50 to maybe $8 corn again. And we learned the, the lesson the hard way this year. You can't feed cattle $8 corn and make any money. Based on what you think might happen in the cattle market over the next few months, when do you think you might see or might be able to carve out some sort of positive margin? Great question. I think it's not gonna be until you get to where you can feed these cattle cheaper corn, because once again, you can't make money feeding these cattle eight dollar corn. I'm really concerned as we go into the summertime as far as the market's concerned. This year, you always have a big increase from first quarter cattle supply to second quarter cattle supply. And this year, we had the smallest increase from first quarter to second quarter ever in history. Now we're going to have the largest increase from second quarter to third quarter ever in history. 
July through September is horrible beef demand time, and we're gonna pile all this meat into this time period. I think it could get really bad here. Now, for those people that are hedged, they're gonna be fine or cut their cattle covered some way with puts or something. And so if you don't get beat up too bad, I think you're gonna have a chance to buy some feeders there because there you're gonna be able to buy some feeders that you're gonna be able to put that cheaper corn in in the fall. And then I think a guy's gonna have a chance come next spring. There, there was never really a remedy to the demand concern, was there? Beef demand is not good because beef has gotten too high. And that's another thing everybody missed. Everybody thought we were gonna have $1.40, $1.50 cattle. The consumer's not gonna pay that. They're not even, every time the market goes to $1.30, it hits a wall and drops. The, the consumer's not willing to pay that. Beef has priced itself out of the market and you've got cheap chicken and cheap pork to rival it and it's really a problem and I think that problem's going to remain for a while. Packers seem to be making a little bit of money though. Packers got over and got on top of this thing. Beef got, beef got considerably higher going into Memorial Day holiday and the Packers done really well managing some his supply, not over killing the cattle that are in front of him because he knows he doesn't have a lot yet but he knows they're coming. So he doesn't have to, he's not trying to overkill and be greedy as far as what he's making for money because they kind of know they got round in front of this thing now and I think they're going to be in good shape probably into October, maybe December. How aggressive are you seeing feedlots be right now? Interesting question. What I've heard around and talking to people, we're kind of in a funny gray area here because we're about half full. What I hear most people, you've got feed yards that are loaded up and they're clear full or they've got nothing. And so we're kind of in a funny position of being in the middle, which I'm fine with. We never are much more than half full this time of year. So it's going to be interesting going forward to see what happens because those yards that are full, it's going to be interesting to see if they can sustain another round of losses to go into the fall again. Do you try to position yourself anywhere related to corn before that June 28th acreage report? Great question. Not going to touch it. I, you know, that you're just playing Russian roulette there. Now, you're going to have some idea by then because you're going to have some idea what the crop looks like and what kind of weather you've had and maybe a little inkling of what weather after that's going to be like. So if you feel pretty safe, yeah, a guy can maybe sit there and wait and, and go hand to mouth a little bit. But I'm just warning you, physical supplies of corn from the end of July till the combines hit the field are going to be really tight. Next week, we'll look at corn and soybean markets with Roy Smith leading up to the June 28th planted acreage and grain stocks report. By a vote of 66 to 27 this time, the Senate has passed a five-year farm bill. Senators agreed on legislation last year, too, but House members failed to pass their own version. They're now on stage again with a bipartisan Senate deal aiming to cut $4 billion out of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. The House is looking at cutting around $20 million. Direct payments to farmers are gone in the Senate version and look to be the same in the House, but there are differences in crop insurance. Speaker John Boehner said he'd vote for the House Farm Bill version and wants to do so yet this month. Farmers across the country have planted 71 percent of the country's soybean crop, but the nation's largest bean producer has a problem. Iowa is currently enduring its slowest pace of soybean planting since 1993. At 35 percentage points behind its five-year average, Iowa trails only Wisconsin for progress compared to normal. It's also facing another unusual issue. On June 2nd, a crop consultant found soybean cyst nematode females on roots of susceptible plants, which were planted 26 days prior. Iowa State Extension plant pathologist Greg Tilka told DTN he was surprised because in a cool spring like 2013, he would have estimated SCN emergence at 40 to 45 days after planting. In February at the World Soybean Research Conference in South Africa, we talked with Greg about the exceptional conditions nematodes faced in 2012 and how effective seed has become in managing a yield crushing pest. It's a great way for farmers to manage soybean cyst nematode. There are hundreds of varieties for farmers throughout the Midwest to pick from that have resistance to soybean cyst. One of the weaknesses is that all those varieties, or almost all of them, contain one same set of genes. But in general, it's effective at uh, continuing to produce high yields, although we are seeing the nematode starting to build up the ability to reproduce on that common type of resistance. Right, what does that mean? What does it mean when you say that uh, it, they offer the same type of resistance and then how does it adapt? So we talk about the different types of resistance as sources of resistance. The soybean breeders of the world would consider them breeding lines, but they're, they're um, 
breeding lines of soybeans that have good pest resistance but not very good agronomic traits. So they cross those with high yielding soybeans to get high yielding soybeans with good nematode resistance, but it involves the same set of four or five genes. And so over time, if you use that same type of resistance over and over again, the nematode gets selected for. It, it builds up the ability to reproduce on that resistance. Much I liken it much to like uh, weed becoming resistant to glyphosate or Roundup. How, that, how does it affect yield though? Well, I mean, that's the... what, we're, what I presented on today was surprisingly it hasn't affected yield yet. So it's not a good thing that our nematode is building up numbers on resistant varieties, but we haven't seen it take a big yield hit yet. So um, I'm still a little nervous, but uh, what I tell farmers in Iowa, for example, is I, I jokingly say the sky's not falling yet, but it is getting a little cloudy. So <laughs> it's not a good thing that our SCN populations are building up on the common type of resistance, but the take home message today was it hasn't really hurt our yields yet. One of the notes you said today was 2012. All the research was sort of along the same lines until you got to 2012, right. how so? Never seen anything like it before. Uh, 2012 was a drought in Iowa, as in much of the Midwest, and nematode reproduction was absolutely crazy. It's, I can't come up with a better word for it. Yields were surprisingly not bad at all, in fact, surprisingly good, but I have never seen soybean cyst nematode reproduce on both susceptible and resistant soybeans to the level I did in 2012. And they're predicting very dry conditions for 2013, so I'm curious to see if it happens again. Right, just to see if it's an anomaly or not. Right. As a scientist, we always want to do replications, and so 2013 might be a repeat of 2012, and I'll be real curious to see if we see it again. Speaking of, as you look at the future here, what do you think is next? What do you think needs to be looked at? Well, uh, farmers need to definitely know if they have soybean cyst nematode, they need to get in a good rotation with non-host crops like corn. And in their soybean years, they need to plant good soybean cyst nematode varieties. And then they probably should think about these new seed treatments that Syngenta and Bayer uh, and other companies are offering for even added protection against soybean cyst nematode. Are there any drawbacks to planting a resistant variety yield-wise? Not any, cost wise? Yeah, not anymore. The resistant varieties, you don't pay a premium for the bag of seed. And anymore, they yield very, very well, even in the presence of low nematode numbers or no SCN. So I can kind of think how you're thinking, and yeah. some farmers just jump right to it and say, well, if soybean cyst nematode is around, I'm just going to grow a cyst-resistant soybean for protection. And that's not a bad choice. How prevalent is it in Iowa and across the Midwest? Well, in Iowa, through random surveys done a couple times, 74% of the fields, so three out of four fields. In Illinois, it's more like four out of every five fields. And in Nebraska, it's just going to continue to spread most of the soybean producing counties. It's already been found. And I haven't seen any random survey data yet, but I'm sure it's quite common. But in the end, you think we're making headway on this? Oh, I, I do. I think we are. The key for farmers is to catch it when numbers are low. It's much easier to keep low numbers low than it is to drive high numbers down. And so farmers really need to test their fields by either pulling soil samples and sending them to the university there in Lincoln or digging roots and looking for the nematode uh, during the growing season. You can see our complete coverage from the 2013 World Soybean Research Conference on our website at marketjournal.unl.edu slash South Africa. The June Nebraska farmer explains why plastic pesticide containers are not only a risk to the environment, but also your children. That's why UNL Extension is once again sponsoring pesticide container recycling sites across Nebraska. More than 2.1 million pounds of plastic containers have disappeared because of the program. In June's Nebraska farmer, you can find a complete list of drop-off locations. You can also view the May 10th episode of Market Journal for more details. While Nebraska's southeast corner features no drought classification at all, the western half ranges from moderate to exceptional drought. With feed supplies already in short supply, UNL Extension recently held a workshop on the sustainable use of crop residues on cow-calf and yearling operations in Mead and North Platte, featuring academic experts and an industry panel. We spoke with Rick Rasby after the conference at the R.B. Warren Arena on UNL's East Campus about using forages and residues and how recent rains have separated parts of Nebraska. You, you take a look at eastern Nebraska, we've, we've received rain and um, 
it's, it's been good rain too. And so, uh, you know, the pastures have greened up, uh, probably as important, the, uh, the ponds have filled up too. So at least there's a watering source out there. As you move uh, further west, uh, not as much rain. And, uh, you know, you get pasture green up, but um, without moisture, that pasture is probably going to be uh, stressed here uh, if we get some warm weather, and we will get warm weather. And so uh, I think for the most part, uh, we've, been, we've been blessed with some rain on some end of the states, but in other ends of the state, uh, probably not as well. Is liquidation still on the radar for some producers? You know, you take a look at uh, uh, sales uh, uh, in Nebraska and sale barns. Uh, you take a look at what they're sending out. They, there's still pears coming to town. And so, uh, uh, you know, we're into to June, and so we typically would turn out in May in, in some of the uh, more ranch country and they probably made some evaluation in regards to the amount of forage that they'll have available and uh, that's why we're still seeing some pears come to town. You were part of a UNL Extension workshop talking about some different utilizations for uh, some sort of feed use here because it's probably going to be short again this year. When you look at the forage supply, what does that look like? Well, if you take a look at uh, overall uh, uh, forage production over the last few years, there's a, a steep decline nationally and there's probably a couple reasons for that. Uh, the drought, the widespreadness of the drought probably has uh, decreased the amount of hay produced, but also uh, when the price of corn went up, any of that uh, ground that was hay ground that could be tilled, it probably went to, to row crop production. And so when you take a look at it overall, uh, uh, hay production's down. And, and that would be probably the same case here in Nebraska. And so uh, uh, I think as you, as you look down the road, uh, being able to start to secure some forages right now would probably be pretty important. And again this year, probably some low quality stuff is going to come into play? You know, I, t I tell you what, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day and uh, I said, you know, you, you'll probably tell your grandkids that you fed alfalfa to cows at one time and <laughs> they'll probably look at you and say, no, you never did. But, uh, you know, you take a look at it with the inventory that we have on hand. Uh, Cow-calf producers are probably going to have to look at lower quality forages and uh, much like what we had to do, do last year. And so uh, we need to uh, think about how we can secure those feeds and then what we might do to them maybe to increase uh, uh, some of the digestibility of that low quality forage. Go through some of that stuff with me. If you're having to use those things, what do you need to make sure you do before you feed them? Yeah, you know, uh, um, we still have access to distiller's grains. And so uh, to me, distiller's grains and low quality forage go together real well. Um, of course, the needs to be priced right, and so uh, we need to continue to take a look at that as an option uh, here in Nebraska. When you think of uh, uh, something that might change some of the digestibility, you think of ammoniation. It was a process that uh, uh, was developed many, many years ago, and we hardly talked about it anymore because we had distiller's grains. But uh, the last few years, it's been uh, on the radar screens of many producers and uh, has been economical. And so with with uh, ammoniation, you actually can increase uh, uh, digestibility of that low quality forage through that process. And when you're able to uh, increase digestibility, you can increase forage intake. And so you can get more of that forage, low quality forage into the cattle. Would the assumption be that hay price is gonna be pretty, pretty sky high? You know, well that's really, uh, that's really gonna be, uh, uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think uh, as a producer, because you know, we're not too far off from really uh, uh, wheat harvest and wheat harvest Work, our wheat look works good in the uh, ammoniation process, and so I think we need to start thinking about that thing, uh, that kind of thing right now. Um, you know, with the hay inventories uh, and the amount of hay that we used, uh, it's hard to think that it's not going to be high priced. But uh, uh, let's see if we can't get a hold of some low quality forage and keep costs down. UNL has a variety of tools to help manage feed supplies. Rick says UNL Extension will soon release an app based on the corn stock grazing calculator. We'll update you on that progress. If you're interested in learning more information about corn yields after residue removal, you can watch our interview with Terry Kloppenstein from the September 7, 2012 episode of Market Journal. On our recent trip to North Platte, we talked with UNL Extension economist Matt Stockton about decision making during drought. Mass says a cattle producer who faces high input prices needs to think about that now rather than when it's too late. It's not a single year decision either because what I do this year is going to impact what I do next year. Okay, so let's say if I keep too many cattle and or is so to speak or I keep a lot of I keep all my cattle and I end up buying tons and tons of hay or spending a lot of money on on feed. That feed cost is something I have to go down to the bank and borrow. How long is it going to take me to recover from that versus if I sold the cattle 
deferred the income on a tax deferral or something like that or whatever I, you know, my strategy was, and then come back and buy the cattle back. Which one of those is going to cost me the least or which one am I going to lose the least money? Sometimes it's not a matter of profit maximization, it's a matter of loss minimization. Because in business it isn't always, you know, I make profit every year. Some years are not good, some years are. So I think that's what you have to look at. You have to really be honest with yourself and say, okay, this is what feeds cost me, this is how much feed it's going to take, this is how much labor it's going to take, and this is what's going to happen. Our full interview with Matt is available online, including his thoughts on the cost to rebuild a herd's genetics. At the beginning of the month, we showed you how corn and soybean growers in the Nebraska Ag Water Management Network were using soil sensors to measure water below the ground. With most of Nebraska's crop now in the field, Aaron Nigren is back this week to show you how you might be able to benefit from measuring evapotranspiration. The next step for producers in the Nebraska Ag Water Management Network, uh, for those that have an ET gauge or atmometer, um, the ET gauge is a tool that we use to give us a reading of crop water use throughout the season. Um, so that we can get a, get a reference ET that we, then we can calculate our actual crop water use. Um, this gives us the same value as all the weather stations across the state. The nice thing is the ET gauge is something close and local um, that you can get a little bit better number maybe for your location. The value that you get is good for a, a five or six mile radius. Um, so you don't need, usually one producer can get by with one ET gauge. So with the ET gauge, the, the first thing we need to do before we go out to the field is do a little bit of prep work. Um, best thing is to get a bottle of distilled water. Uh, we need to use distilled water instead of tap water, otherwise it will eventually damage our sensor. So once you have your, your distilled water, um, go ahead and pour the distilled water into the ET gauge, filling up all the way. If you fill it too full, don't worry, you can always um, pull down on the glass tube to release the water out. But once we have it filled up with water, uh, next thing you want to do um, is fill up the ceramic top. So pour some water into the ceramic top. It usually goes down a little bit, so you may need to add some more water a second time. Once you have that done, go ahead and throw the suction tube beneath the water line. Best method I've found is to use my finger to cap it off, and then as you release and get it below the water level, it should start flowing. That way you make sure you have no error in the, in the lines. Then you can go ahead and, and attach the suction tube to the ceramic top, and then go ahead and put that back onto the top of the T-gauge. The one thing you don't want to forget before you to leave is to install the bird wires. Those bird wires are there to keep the birds from sitting on it, um, so be sure to put those. If you can't find them from last year, um, it's a good idea to find, you know, purchase another set. With the ET gauge, we're going to go out once a week and read that. Try to read it the same day of the week, um, about the same time of day. So once a week, go out there and just read it like a reverse rain gauge. So you're going to see how far drop, how far the water level drops. Um, it may be an inch, it may be two inches, it depends on the week. The key with this is that it gives us a better number than just using book values. Um, every year is a little bit different, so that ET gauge gives us a better reading of our crop water use. The other thing we're going to need to do with an ET gauge is track our grow stage. Um, so be sure to know how to, to um, determine the grow stage of corn or soybeans, depending on what you're irrigating. So depending on that grow stage, it's going to give us a different crop coefficient. That crop coefficient is going to vary anywhere from 0.1 all the way to 1.1. V2 corn is only going to have a crop coefficient of 0.1. Once we get to V16 right before tassel, our crop coefficient goes to 1.1. So that multiplier gives us a lot larger crop water use um, depending on our growth stage. If you missed the first half of Aaron's demonstration regarding soil sensors, it's available on the Market Journal website and mobile app as part of the May 31st episode. Now with this week's weather forecast, here is UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we are again for the weekly forecast. With, during this past week, we did see off and on thunderstorm activity across the state, not widespread except for yesterday where we did see some severe weather breakout. But at least everybody did see somewhat semblance of some precipitation. And it's the nature of the beast at this time of the year as we start to see more scattered thunderstorm activity. And if you fall under the thunderstorms, you tend to do very well. And if you miss it, you wait till the next uh, opportunity. Now, this aggressive pattern looks like it's going to continue. Uh, doesn't mean we're going to see a complete washout as we go forward in time, but certainly we're going to have daily chances of thunderstorm activity as we sit right at the intersection between the battle of warm air to our south and the cooler air to our north. So let's get to the models and see what we'd expect as we go through this next seven day period. And as we go to the upper air pattern, we'll notice that the the waves that were responsible for our thunderstorm activity have moved to the east, but we have another wave that's moving across the central plains, and that should touch off thunderstorm activity, particularly across the southern half of the 
the state this afternoon and during the overnight hours. And as you move north, there'll be lesser chances. Uh, Broad-based coverage here, anywhere from a quarter to a half an inch uh, with isolated thunderstorm activity. We may see uh, precipitation totals in the one to one and a half inch range. Now, as we get to tomorrow, uh, we'll basically move all of that energy to the east. Uh, it doesn't look like we're going to see any significant activity across the state. It should be a decent Father's Day. There might be some pop-up thunderstorms, but it's going to be fairly isolated in nature. Now, as we go into Monday, we'll notice that the ridge tries to build in across the central Rockies, and we'll see a cooler pattern developing across the northern plains once again into the central and eastern Corn Belt, and eastern Nebraska will be much cooler than western Nebraska. But overall, we're just looking at the chance for an isolated thunderstorm, but no broad-based coverage. And as we get into Tuesday, we see the pattern pretty much mimics itself. We're basically in a slight northwest flow, so we'll see some cooler temperatures in the east, the warmer air trying to build into the southwestern part of the state. Now, as we go into Wednesday, we have another trough trying to dig its way into the western United States, and some of that energy may shoot out over the Rockies, so we could be looking at some thunderstorm activity. The best chances look to be across the western part of the state, with much lesser chances as we move eastward. Now, as we get into Thursday, we'll see that that upper air trough tries to make it in a little bit more quick or closer to us. We'll have a southwesterly flow uh, over western Nebraska uh, in the afternoon hours and basically we'll be looking at the chance for thunderstorm activity redeveloping and then moving east during the overnight hours and as we get into Friday we'll see that that trough still remains in place. We have some warm air bubbling up and some of the temperatures in, in southern Nebraska may actually make it up into the low to mid 90s. So as we look at the temperature forecast what we are looking for is Temperatures basically stuck in the 70s to the north and the 80s to the south with a warming trend dramatically as we get to next weekend. And we have those daily chances of thunderstorm activity. In terms of the 8 to 14 day forecast, the warm air slides to the east. And in terms of precipitation, we'll notice that the majority of the precipitation remains well to our east. We're kind of stuck in the normal category with drier conditions towards southwest Nebraska. Thanks, Al. Our interviews from today's show with Mike Briggs, Greg Tilka, Rick Rasby, and Matt Stockton are available individually as part of the June 7th episode of Market Journal on our website and through the Market Journal mobile app for smartphones and tablets. Next week, Roy Smith will join us as corn and soybean markets prepare for the USDA's planted acreage and grain stocks reports on June 28th. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska.